In May 2015, I took a short trip on the Superior Hiking Trail, brought along the latest version of my Grizzbridge, called it the Aerial, made a video about that trip. Um, what was different about the Aerial is the way that I had created the cord channel and also recessed the spreader bars. I promised in that video that I would make uh, one about the engineering details of the Aerial. That's what this video is. For those that are interested in the hammock itself, uh, well, one, you'll have to wait until I'm done with it, put in some end caps, maybe a bug net. Um, I'm expecting to make a video, we'll call it tricking out the Aerial uh, in May or June of 2016. But this video is about uh, the do-it-yourself details. So uh, the three followers who have been begging me for this, uh, here's that video. And anybody else that wants to go along for the ride, um, hope you like CAD CAM. The aerial suspension is made entirely of Amsteel 764th cord. There are six such cords at each end. There are two that form the suspension triangle. And then along each side, there's a longer cord, which is the suspension curve. At the corners, we bring the ends of these pieces together and splice them into each other, leaving in the middle a small gap into which we can put the tip of the spreader bar. So I have a finished version of that right here where at one end we have a fixed eye, uh, and you can hook that onto, say, one of Dutch's uh, bridge hammock hooks or something like that. And then we go 30 inches from the top of that uh, to the middle of the first of these uh, little gaps that I talked about. And then we follow the curve, the arc length, to the midpoint of the second of these gaps and then again another 30 inches to another fixed eye. And so the trick is to do the splicing with such precision that we can make the center of these gaps to be precisely the uh, suspension arc length. Uh, and to do that we need to be careful about the tapering, we need to be careful about the measuring, we need to be careful uh, about the way we do the splicing, and I'll show you how to do all of these things. Mark each point the same way. At inch one we mark what we'll call the taper point. At inch seven, we mark what I'll call the stop point, and at inch eight and one quarter, we mark what I'll call a berry point. To create the taper, we will separate out the eight strands uh, of the cord up to the taper point. Then on each side, we will identify one strand and cut it off entirely at the taper point uh, to reduce the bulk. And then to uh, finish it off, we will find a strand that's in the middle and cut it off in the middle and by doing that with every taper point the same way we get a uniform taper. We'll now go through the process of splicing the gap into which the pole tip will go using two different colors of cord to help uh, aid in the visual identification of what's going on. The loop turner here is put through the berry point on one cord and we are pulling the other cord through up to but not through the stop point. And that is important. We want to do this all the time because we want to have the lengths be the same. Uh, then we complete the locked Brummel in the usual fashion. There's nothing fancy about that. Then we'll move to reverse the rolls, pushing the loop turner through the berry point of the black cord and pulling the silver cord up to uh, the stop point but not pulling it through. Then we complete the locked Brummel, and then we have two ends to bury, and we bury them both. We now go about establishing the lengths of the cord, starting with the uh, side suspension. Uh, remember that we have a 7-inch taper and bury. For us, the interesting point of reference is the center of the gap, and the gap is uh, an inch and a quarter, and so uh, the first length of interest is the uh, 7 and 5 eighths. Uh, from there now, we have a suspension triangle from the center of that gap to the edge, which is 30 inches. Uh, we have to compensate for the fact that we'll have two berries in that stretch, and we've determined empirically that uh, a seven inch berry with our taper uh, reduces the length of the cord into which it's buried by an inch and a half. We have two of those, and so uh, we have to account for that. Now we have an eye splice, um, which would be an inch long, and uh, then we have a locked Brummel and eye splice that we have empirically determined loses a little bit, so we compensate for that for three quarters of an inch, and then we, uh, we bury um, the, uh, the end, and so that, that gives us uh, 48 and uh, 7 eighths inches. 
Moving to the suspension arc, at both ends we have the 7 inch taper and we add to that half the gap width, so that'll give us twice 7 and 5 eighths. Then we add to that the uh, gap between the uh, midpoints, which is uh, 68 and a quarter inches. And then we need to account for two berries. Adding it all up, we need 86 inches for the suspension arc. going to walk through now tools used for the job. Start off with a computer because I'm computing curves of various types and so I have formula for that and so I program in them and then they'll give me a chart that says at this point the curve should be such and such a height. Um, so then I will take that um, set of measurements and go to whatever template I'm using. Um, each curve will have a flat edge and um, I know what height the curve ought to be at every position on the x-axis and so with this square edge then I can mark the height of the curve, say at every inch, and then I can interpolate those lines to get the curve. When I have done that, then I create templates like these. I'm using poster board here from Walmart. This is the suspension curve from on the side of the, uh, the hammock. It's seven inches deep and uh, 66 inches long. And uh, it's relatively stiff, which means that I, um, I can uh, measure uh, the width of the arc length, which is useful, and use this over and over. And this is the template I have created for uh, the end cap. So I have my templates and then I need to go to the fabric. To get square ends in the fabric, um, I'm going to use a uh, laser a square like so, so that I can uh, line one edge of this along a uh, long edge of the fabric and then another laser line will go um, across the narrow edge of the fabric. And that'll just be visual. And so then I can align this straight edge, this uh, five foot straight edge uh, along the laser line and then uh, mark it with my chalk pencil. And so I have the marks from the suspension curves and the straight lines and then I will cut it with this very handy hot knife. Um, a thing I like about this model of a hot knife is that it has a base here when when you cut the fabric you slide the fabric between the base and the hot knife and that means that um, I can just cut the fabric on the floor. I don't have to have um, protective glass or anything like that. And so, uh, oh, let's not forget, let us not forget the persuader. This is the device I use to persuade pieces of fabric to come together uh, with thread. Um, I wore out the old one that I've been using for years. This is a Janome uh, HD 3000. Um, it's a bit heavier, a bit heavier duty, and uh, so far I like it quite a lot. Now we go through how we mark up a piece of fabric with the different pieces of the hammock that we cut out and assemble. Uh, the length of the fabric is 102 inches long. The width is 60 inches. That's usable fabric. It doesn't include the selfage. We mark off 7 inch corridors on either side. We'll take those strips and make cord channels out of them. And that gives us 46 inches from corner to corner underneath the spreader bar. On the right hand side then we mark the shape of the end caps. The important thing here is that uh, the arc length of that is 43 inches. Next we mark off a nine and a half inch extension of the body past the spreader bars. Half an inch of that is lost to seam allowance. That nine inches is gonna be along the suspension triangle curve and so the actual increase in depth that we get past the spreader bars is gonna be closer to seven and a half inches. We add that same nine and a half inches to the other end and then put in the suspension curve, which has a seventh inch depth. That's going to give us 32 inches of hammock at the midpoint. Finally, we shape the body of the hammock past the spreader bars uh, with straight line cuts so that the length of the edge of the fabric where it meets the um, end cap is 43 inches, which is the arc length of the end cap. We're not going to take the strips that we cut at the edge of the hammock body, which were seven inches from the edge of the selfage here uh, to the cut point, uh, and turn them into a folded over piece that is a little over two inches wide, and uh, that's going to be the basis for the channel when we fold it over. We're going to make heavy use of marking and folding, so we're going to start with a mark to line that's two and a quarter inches in from the edge. Part of the process is to fold the, uh, the fabric up to the beginning of the selfage to this line and to remember what that whole line is I'm going to iron it. Position it like so. Take my iron. I make a lot of use of this iron. It's going to help uh, guide the creation of this channel without having to use pins. 
pins slow things down. And actually, some of the angles that we use are hard to use pins with. After ironing those folds, I finished off the, uh, the raw edge with a bit of bias tape. Um, this is a little decorative. It's going to be on the outside, but also will be loose, and so I might be able to attach things to it. Then did a sharp crease, not exactly down the middle, but folded it over so that the folded edge came to the top of that bias tape. A number of reasons for that. Uh, one is going to make it easier to pin this uh, onto, the, uh, onto the curve of the hammock. Also cut buttonholes uh, to allow that cord gap through. And so uh, we're ready now to pin this to the, uh, to the hammock. To forestall any creep that happens when you sew long seams, we pin the channel and the hammock together at the corners, at the midpoint, and at the midway point between the midpoint and the corners. And uh, that helps us manage the creep as it happens. Now with the sharp crease in the cord, can move the edge of the hammock body to that. And now the value of the bias tape is that I can feel it right under my fingers. I can feel it, and so I can position this folded edge right up to the edge of the bias tape. And that means that I can center this just as I want it. So again, move the hammock body to the fold of crease, fold it over, fold this edge until I feel the bias tape, and then put in a pin. I'll do this all the way along the line, and uh, then I am ready to sew this channel down. First run one seam that serves to attach the cord uh, to the body. Uh, we do that with the bias side down. Then we thread the cord through the channel and attach it at the corners. Then we put on a zipper foot and we run a seam with the zipper foot right up against the cord. And so that's gonna make a very tight channel for the cord. Then we swap out the zipper foot for the regular foot and we do the same thing. We sew the final seam through with the, uh, the foot right up against the cord. Since it's wider, uh, that places it between the two seams that we put through. The thread that I'm using is heavyweight Goodman polyester. Um, it looks quite sturdy and I think should hold. So for quite some time now, I've been building my hammocks with recessed spreader bars. So the build that we're looking at in this video, they're five and a half feet apart rather than six and a half or seven feet apart as is common with commercial bridge hammocks. And the reason for that is that by bringing the spreader bar in closer to your shoulders, it's gonna be flatter under your shoulders for a given length of the spreader bar and length of fabric underneath of your shoulders. And so that's a good thing, I think. Uh, a side benefit is that you'll make the hammock shorter uh, and so it will fit under standard tarps more easily. Now I'm six foot one, which means I'm going to spill beyond the spreader bar at both ends of the hammock, which means that I want the depth of the hammock beyond the spreader bar to be the same as the depth of the hammock right under the spreader bar. Now the geometry is a little bit complicated as we'll see in what I did in the past was to uh, fit by cutting divots and hope that I got them right. But even as I was doing that, I was thinking there gotta be a way of computing the way to cut the body so that when you assemble the hammock, you're gonna have the depth that you want beyond the spreader bar without having to do any fitting. And so that's what we're gonna do now. So blow the dust off of your slide rules and let us take a stroll down hammock-induced math the magic land. In the aerial, my head lies right underneath of the spreader bar, illustrated here by a bowling ball, and I want the hammock body to be flat at that spot, not dipping up or down. To get this kind of flatness, I'm going to have to cut the body of the hammock beyond the spreader bar so that as it hangs from the suspension cord, things remain flat. To do these calculations, I'm going to have to make some assumptions about how the hammock body is shaped under load. My knee-jerk reaction would be to use a parabola, but that would be wrong because the weight of the head pulls the sides of the hammock body taut down from the spreader bar. The calculation I'll do imagines that the bowling ball rolls towards the end cap, and as it rolls, it remains the same height from the ground throughout. For a given distance past the spreader bar, I can compute the distance between the suspension cords, and I can compute the rise of the suspension cords above the spreader bar. This frontal view shows that I know the distance between the suspension cords, and I know the height from the bottom of the bowling ball to the straight line between the suspension cords. 
what I need to do is to compute the length of the fabric from the point on the suspension cord down and around the bowling ball and then back up to the other suspension cord. Now things get mathematical. Imagine the angle theta formed at the center of the bowling ball from the vertical uh, to the point where the fabric first touches the ball. For a given angle of theta, we can compute the angle at which the fabric leaves the ball and heads up towards the suspension cords. If we do this on both sides, imagining the trajectory of two sides of the fabric, we can continue on until the distance between them is what they need to be between the suspension cords. Now we can compute the height of the imagined line between those points from the bottom of the bowling ball and ask, is this the height it needs to be? If the answer is no, we can try a different theta and get a different height and compare it with the height we need to have. And if the answer is no again, try yet another theta and do the same thing. We approach this in a methodical fashion using a technique that's known in computing as binary search that's guaranteed to lead us to the angle that gives us the height that we need to have. And when we find that angle, we have found the length of the fabric that we want. This model gives us a way of computing the width the hammock body should be as a function of the distance from the spreader bar and that will give us a curve. We can look at that curve and uh, then decide how to cut the hammock body to achieve the desired end. Now we can see that the curve is generally linear up to around four inches out and after that starts to flatten out. So if we get very much farther out than say uh, eight inches, it, the straight line approximation is not going to be very good. But remember we only need to go out seven and a half inches. So considering the deviations of the straight line from the true curve, we find that at 43 inches we stay pretty true up near the head and the error out where it doesn't matter so much is not so large. That's it. Congratulations. You made it through all the gory details. Send me your name and I'll send you a certificate that says uh, so-and-so survived the engineering of the Grisbridge Aerial. Uh, don't forget, there's a, another video coming up uh, shortly after I finish this we'll called Tricking Out the Aerial, and uh, we'll get into some details about the end cap, uh, the suspension, uh, the bug net, and uh, cool stuff like that. See you then.